I'd like to formally welcome everyone to Soul Gold's live event hosted by Six. I'm pleased to introduce today CEO Scott Caldwell and CFO Chris Stackhouse. Uh, they'll take us through a brief presentation on their recently uh, released annual filing, followed by a live Q&A session. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the screen at any point during the presentation. Uh, we'll try to get to everyone. Uh, we're targeting about a half hour for today's event, uh, so please do enter your questions to make sure that we're able to get to them on time. As always, this uh, event is being recorded and will be available on Six.com as well as YouTube to watch afterwards. But without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Scott and Chris to kick things off. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I think we kind of have a worldwide audience as, as per the norm. But uh, Chris and I are going to go over a short presentation and then uh, try to answer uh, any questions you might have. So next one. There are some forward-looking statements uh, in this presentation, and so we do have the cautionary language. And next slide, Chris. So the highlights of 2023, um, we ended, and Chris will talk more about the financials, but we ended the, the year with a little over $32 million in cash, and all the currencies in this are US dollars, by the way. And we uh, continue to attract new investment, uh, 30 million placement by Jiangxi Copper um, and a, 30, a $50 million royalty uh, purchased by a Cisco. That was late last year in the fourth quarter, December last year. We had and a major achievement. We successfully merged with Cornerstone Capital Resources. And so we now the main uh, prize in that merger was we have 100% of the Cascabel project. And uh, of course, we picked up some exciting expiration tenements with Cornerstone as well. And uh, a couple of them have moved into our actually our top 10 of the uh, 90 odd tenements that we have in the country. Um, so we're, we're really excited about those tenements as well. So we're working on one of those now. So it was a successful merger. It, it uh, did take a little longer than we thought, but we did close it uh, in February. Um, we, we went through restructuring, and Chris will talk about the results of that, but we simplified the organization. Essentially, uh, our Australian presence is strategic in nature. Our board is there. Uh, or most of our board is there. And we have one person in UK, and we've moved as many functions down to Ecuador as we can. So we simplified the organization and uh, reduced our workforce uh, worldwide. We started a technical study um, and it'll be complete in the first quarter of next year. We call it a phase development approach to Cascabel. It, it, exactly what it says is, is start out at a, at a reduced rate, lower capital, shorter construction schedule uh, from beginning construction and, and production. And then you expand over time using cash flow from the, from the, uh, the operation to expand. You end up in the same place, you mine the same resource that's in the current PFS. It's just a different uh, way to look at how to develop it. And we'll see how that turns out. Again, that should be completed in the first quarter, early in the first quarter of next year. The strategic review, that process is still ongoing. There's no timeline. Um, and why no timeline? It's a, it's a, you know, we have a lot of assets, a lot of great assets, Cascabel being the prize, the crown, crown jewel. But we do have 89 other tenements. And so when people are getting into the data room, they have a lot of uh, information to look at. But there is a lot of interest, a lot of people in the data room. And so we continue to work through that process uh, over, the, over the course of the year. I'm excited about the process. And again, what is it? It's, it's you know, it could be a, a joint venture on an outside expiration property. It could be the sale of, of an expiration property. Um, you know, an involvement in Cascabel. So it, it's really looking at our entire portfolio and seeing how we, strate how we strategically uh, extract value from that, maximizing a stakeholder value, our shareholders, the, the, the people in the communities we work in, our royalty holders, um, the government of Ecuador, our employees. So it, it's, it's maximizing not only shareholder value, obviously, and I'm a shareholder, so uh, that's a key a key metric, but it's stakeholder value. All of our all of our partners that we work with, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Chris. I believe Chris will take it from here and answer and, and answer the hard questions. Well, thanks, Scott, <clears throat> and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm not going to go through our entire set of financial statements, but I've 
pulled together a few uh, sort of choice uh, key figures to run through with everyone today and, and try to draw some of the key conclusions, at least from management and the, the company's perspective. So as Scott mentioned, all the rep dollar rep uh, amounts we're referencing today are in US dollars. Um, and we do we did end the year with cash of 32 and a half million. You can see it's a little bit uh, higher, but effectively about the same cash balance as we ended the prior year with. Um, and you can see we've we've capitalized, so a lot of work was done in advancing uh, Cascabel and some of the various other assets uh, in the Solvold uh, portfolio. Yeah. You can see there was a significant increase in the non-current assets, which is effectively the capitalization of our, our, our various projects and moving them forward. The, the details of the balance sheet, uh, obviously, you need to look through and, and go through the notes. Um, current payables has increased over the prior year. Uh, it's just general working provisions, uh, payables. Um, some of the restructuring costs uh, that had to be accrued at June 30th are sitting there in there as well. Um, so you can see, in, I think it's note 19 of the statements where it breaks down that in a, in a little bit more detail for the reader. The, the other piece that I'd like people to kind of pull away from the balance sheet is the own share reserve. Um, so it says 25.4 million. And why that's a little bit interesting, that's the, that's the shares that Cornerstone held in Soul Gold. Um, prior to the acquisition of Cornerstone. So when, when Soul Gold acquired them, those shares were not canceled and they sit in the old Cornerstone subsidiary. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those later on in the presentation, but they're worth point, uh, po uh, pointing out. Uh, they had, I think the, the if they were marked to market, they'd be a little bit lower in value today, but as of June 30th, they had a, a value of 25, uh, about 25 million US dollars. So focusing on the balance sheet, why? Um, obviously, it's not in a huge position of strength. If you look at sort of the general uh, advance rate, obviously, we know that to put an advanced cast is going to require a strong balance sheet. Uh, so a lot of the focus of the management team has been around protecting the balance sheet. And so that's come through various ways. Uh, protect the, you know, the cash we do have um, and make it last as long as we have and, and use it in the most value creative ways. Uh, so we, we spoke about that, um, and a lot of that's behind us now, the, the restructuring uh, that Scott had mentioned previously. Uh, the investment attractiveness of Cascabel, so the works that we are doing with our, uh, with our current cash balance, we want to make sure that those dollars are focused on the maximum, val the maximum uh, value creating, which is de-risking Cascabel, uh, which we believe will increase the attractiveness of to potential investors going forward. Uh, we're also looking at this great uh, exploration portfolio. Uh, what opportunities we can generate with that? Uh, so that's that, you know that's sitting on our balance sheet. We have great tracts of land. You know, as an as an example, Porvenir, um, great discovery there. Uh, we just need additional uh, um, resources to help move move those those uh, projects forward. As I mentioned, the show goal, the show goal shares acquired. Uh, we do have that block. Uh, strategics have expressed interest in the in that block, uh, but we're holding on to it for now because we just want to make sure that we do benefits, you know, the current shareholders and the project going forward. Uh, so we uh, we'll use that when we believe it uh, makes sense for the, for the company. So I spoke I spoke about uh, spoke about, re about restructuring. Um, you can see here some sort of key metrics we pulled out. Uh, the average headcount in Ecuador, uh, you can see you know, through the course of 22, 23, and where we're at currently in the current quarter, uh, you, you want to fiscal 2024. So a significant head reduction in our overall headcount in the operations, i.e. in Ecuador, significant reduction in our corporate headcount globally. Um, you know, so the, effectively the, the closure of our, our Brisbane headquarters, um, a significant reduction, uh, we're down to uh, effectively a single uh, person in London. And then um, Scott and myself and a few other key people, which are effectively all um, majority of our work is based in, in Ecuador. And, and Scott, that's where he's sitting today. Unfortunately, I couldn't be down there this week um, getting these statements out uh, for our shareholders. Uh, but I spend quite a bit of time down there as well. well you, can see, you can see the results of driving headcount down and refocusing our dollars. What does that mean to our burn? Uh, you can see those figures there. So our current quarter burn, you know, it's, it's around... $2.6 million a month. Uh, that's down significantly from uh, just, uh, you know, earlier this year. Uh, and we do or we do hope to um, uh, keep moving that down through some additional cost uh, reduction measures. We, we believe we can uh, achieve in getting that closer to $2 million a month uh, as an average burn. 
But in any case, we have a, uh, effectively a fiscal 2024 full work plan uh, that is fully funded. Um, so our current cash balance with our current work plan, uh, we do we you know we do believe can last to the end of fiscal 2024, i.e. June 30th, um, and a little bit beyond. Um, so I'll kind of flip over from I think I might have missed a slide. Let me just go back here. We're going backwards now. Nope. Everything. <laughs> Strategic review. Sorry. There we go. So Scott, maybe uh, I'll pass it back to you and we can give a little more uh, kind of color to the shareholders on the strategic review and where we're at with that right now. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about the strategic review. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is currently underway. And uh, I said a lot of people are interested, uh, as one would expect, in this uh, fantastic portfolio we have, of course, led with the, uh, the tier one asset, Cascabel. But the focus of the review is to maximize value for all of our stakeholders which are shareholders, uh, our employees, our uh, partners, and of course the Ecuadorian government and the local communities we work in. Ongoing, no timeline, a lot of interest in this portfolio. Uh, we believe that Ecuador is a great place to work. Uh, we've had a very good experience here historically and continue to have a great experience uh, working with the communities and the people. Um, I live here in, in Quito. Uh, I've moved to Quito, so I you know, I walk to work every day. It's, it's a wonderful city and, and uh, I'm at Cascabel oh, almost a weekly basis and wherever else I need to be. The discussions, um, the, the review is progressing well. Discussions ongoing with um, credible groups, uh, highly credible groups, and they're in different stages of the reviews. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a complex uh, land package, i.e. a lot of opportunity. And if you're gonna look at the whole company, uh, it's a lot of work to look at the outside tenements, all the data, uh, and then site visits, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a process that takes quite a while to, to do a proper due diligence. So people are interested, they're looking, uh, and it's, it's, it's just an ongoing process. Um, strategic interest, engagement. Um, again, strategic would be you know people that, that we would want to partner with, that we think would work well in the country. They've got a strong balance sheet. They have a, um, a good technical, uh, good management, good ESG programs. Um, and I, I, we know that they're uh, perhaps are in the country already, perhaps are interested in moving into the country because of the great rocks here. You know, Ecuador has some of the best exploration potential in particular for copper, copper porphyries, but you have mines like Lundin, Lundin's Fruta del Norte, which is a phenomenally operated mine. That team is doing a great job, um, and it was uh, built and, and commissioned here successfully. Uh, you're all familiar with the story, but can't say enough good things about uh, this Fruta del Norte uh, achievement and the operation there. Um, you know, Cascabel's significance. Um, Cascabel is a, a tier one asset. It's one of the best I've ever seen. I've worked at Grassburg. I've worked at Koyawasi. I uh, started my career at Porphyry Coppers in Arizona, low grade open pit stuff. Um, but so I've been around some pretty good Porphyry Copper deposits, Grassburg, and of course, uh, Koyawasi. And, and this Cascabel's right up there with them. Um, it will be an underground mine, um, Block Cave uh, eventually. And um, so it, but it, it is a phenomenal mine. It, it, it produces a quality product. It produces a very, very clean concentrate with none of the uh, the bad actors such as arsenic, et cetera, uh, zinc. And, uh, you know, it's got a long mine life. Uh, if, you, if you just took the numbers, took the resource and looked at a reasonable production rate, it's, it's probably 80 years. I'm not saying that, that it's going to run that long, but it, it's, it's a phenomenal asset uh, and it produces a product that's uh, – highly desirable because it's so clean. Uh, a lot of the, the mines in, in the world, as they get deeper and older, their arsenic context, uh, some of the things you don't like to see in contact and concentrate is, is starting to creep up. So highly desirable product, uh, which is a big thing if you're making concentrate, copper concentrate. It's a strategic asset. Um, 
you know, it's I, I've I've talked to a lot of people about uh, Cascabel. I first visited it in 2016. That's when I first invested. I think it was 16, 17. Um, I still own stock. I own uh, about 18.7 million shares. So I'm a shareholder, a stakeholder. Um, it, uh, it it's a very very high quality product uh, a project. It's got some phenomenal grades in the in the high grade core, and and that's the focus of kind of the two, the the, um, the phased approach is to start with the higher grade material, and then as as you expand, you would slowly mill uh, lower grade material rather than extract the entire resource over time. The, the due diligence again. I mentioned this. There's no there's no fixed timeline on our process of the strategic review, and it it you know it's it's a, a lot of work to take a look at these assets um, and give them their just. And there's been a lot of work done on all of the assets. There's a lot of information to look at, and then of course site visits are a are a um, another another uh, element. Uh, not that it's uh, it can't be done. It can be done, but. Our assets go from Colombia all the way to uh, all the way down to Peru, so it's a quite a an extensive uh, site visit if you wanted to look at all of the tenements. Um, Cascabel, of course, has the most interest, but it um, you know tier one asset. I'm really excited about the phased approach, and again, that'll be completed at the end of uh, at the end of the year, early next year, actually, first quarter of 24. Um, we're excited about the opportunity there. We're excited about to continue to de-risk de Cascabel, as Chris mentioned, through some low-cost initiatives in the field. Um, we have option on, some, on, a, on a tails dam, uh, tail storage facility site. We'll do some uh, geotechnical work with our existing staff, an option to purchase uh, that land. Um, we may or may not exercise it based on the technical work. We have a number of tail sites. We're working on the right of way for the concentrate pipeline to the coast, which is an old railway line, uh, things like that to um, to uh, de-risk the project. We have received um, or will receive the early works permit, which would allow us to begin the, the long expiration drives or the declines that, that access the uh, block cave mine. Uh, we, we hope to receive that in short order. Uh, we're working with the, the government on the exploitation contract and the amended uh, Investment Protection Act, and uh, that's proceeding well. So we're receiving uh, approvals, agreements, permits, uh, and uh, so to allow us to advance the project. But again, low-cost initiatives, uh, we're not spending a lot of money on, on outside engineering for process plants, et cetera. We are doing the, the work on the uh, the. the uh, amended or the phased approach definitive or the DF or it's not a definitive feasibility study. It's a PFS. It's an amended PFS. So we're updating that. So we're obviously using outside experts for that. But with that, I'll, I'll leave that alone. And now I think we're probably moving to concluding. Yeah. Well, I think Scott, um, I think the key, you know, you, you kind of went through our uh, look ahead uh, for fiscal 2024. Yeah. You've touched on most of these points, and I think the the, the the key point to tie it all back to our balance sheet is we these are fully funded work programs uh, that we have through the for the remainder of the year. Yeah, I think you're right. And with that, why don't we why don't we open it up to questions, and we'll try to answer any questions we can. I appreciate. It. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, so there are a number of questions that have come in. And just for the people who popped in a bit later during the event, you can submit questions in the chat panel in the bottom right uh, corner of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can today. Um, I noticed there's, there's a number of questions that all kind of lump together. Um, it's people, it seems like long-term shareholders are asking about the share price performance and really just asking what kind of uh, news or catalysts in the near medium term are likely to turn that around. Well, why don't I and Chris, if you want to add into that, again, I'm, I'm a, a long term shareholder and I'm not pleased with the share price as well. Uh, obviously, uh, higher share price is better than what we've got right now. And I think if you look at short term catalysts and it'll just say in the next, uh, let's just say, three to six months, the strategic review is something that I really look forward to. And I think that uh, I think that'll be perceived very, very well by investors. Um, and, and again, the the. the goal of that study is to reduce the, the upfront capital, the initial capital cost. And if you recall, the current capital cost in the, in the, the estimate in the PFS is 
right around 2.7 billion. Is that correct, Chris? I think it is. That's uh, nice. So just under 3 billion US. So we're, we're, the goal of this is to dramatically reduce that cost. We don't have any numbers yet. And uh, when, we, when we have them and they're ready to go, we'll disclose them all. Um, and, uh, but it's, uh, so start out smaller. And, uh, and, and I think people are gonna like the economics and, and it's gonna be a more manageable capital number um, and that, that kind of fits into a lot of different aspects. But if we can get a, a good solid plan, we end up in the same spot and mine the same resource. Eventually over time, we expand to a big block cave mine. So I think that's a good catalyst. I think, you know, some of the permits that I talked about, the approvals of uh, various agreements, uh, we hope to have those uh, in this in the final uh, three months of the year. That'll be some news. Um, and again, if, if there's some developments on the strategic front, uh, in particular on the outside exploration, I think that we're, we've got some very uh, interesting things to talk about there. No, no, no news, nothing to nothing finalized, but there's a lot of interest in the outside stuff. Um, again, it's a complex due diligence when you when you start to look at uh, that outside exploration and Caskville as well. So things I know are going to happen uh, will be various agreements with the government, uh, de-risking permits, things like that. And uh, obviously that uh, revised uh, PFS. Chris, you got any ideas, thoughts? No, I think I think you've nailed all the key ones. Um, I, I think the only other element I'd add is, you know, I, I, from an outside perspective, obviously Scott and I are, are, are very comfortable with Ecuador and geopolitical risk, but there is a this year has been sort of cloudy with the the uh, the election that's been ongoing, um, and after October fifteenth, we're going to have a clear you know uh, idea of who, who's it, which party is in in power and. We, with all of our, our views, you know, with the two uh, candidates that are, are running up at October 15th, both are pro-business, both are pro-mining, um, and I think that'll just reduce another level of, of complexity to the story uh, to allow people to analyze sort of the, the integrity of the asset without uh, analyzing the integrity of, of the country risk. Great. No, appreciate that. Um, Matt asks about admin costs. Really looking to know what goes into that and how many employees you guys currently have? Well, Chris, I'll turn that off to you and I can, if you want, but I, I know the number of employees. Yeah, I mean, so in the case of, of uh, Sogol, I mean, admin costs would be every, almost everything that's sort of not capitalized, uh, your corporate offices, um, and uh, corporate offices outside of Ecuador, but also in Ecuador, um, non sort of, uh, boots on the ground type expenses go into your overall GNA. So it's your, it's your overhead to, to cover the business and, and keep the infrastructure alive. Um, to hut the, I'll have to go back to the slide, but I, it was around 290 is our current um, headcount level. Um, so, and I think that was, the, was that the question, Romeo? Was, uh, yeah, I was looking at what, what comprises your admin costs and what the headcount is. Uh, yeah, and for more detail on on the actual admin costs, I believe there's a, a further breakdown in, in note three of the financial statements. Uh, if you want to kind of dig into a little bit more of the, the public disclosure there. Great, thanks. Um, Rick asks if you can touch on currency risk, if at all, since Ecuador has USD. Yeah, it's it's um, a bit of a unique case in the, sort of the opposite of of, of currency risk. Uh, in our opinion, it's you know, we don't have to deal with sort of a, an unstable local currency um, it, because Ecuador is dollarized and on, and on the U.S. dollar. Uh, th they don't have a country machine like the rest of the world, other governments in the world to you know inflate their economies. They are dependent on foreign direct investment to bring new dollars into the country. They don't have a printer. Um, so this is, you know, to tie back the investment thesis, the government's ultra supportive because uh, foreign direct investment is a way to bring new money into the comp into the country. Um, and so the U.S. dollar benefits that. And from an outside perspective, that's a it's a state. It's a more stable investment um, and helps helps with a little bit more long term view on costs, operating costs and capital costs, because we don't have to add that third variable in of of of, uh, of a local FX rate. I might add, when I was working at Koyawasi, um, when we were building Koyawasi, uh, one of the interesting things was always to look at our Chilean peso costs. And of course, they have the UFA, which is just basically a link to the U.S. dollar. But 
uh, you would the inflation at times was one of our biggest concerns. You make an estimate on labor, and the next day it was wrong. So at least here we have a U.S. dollar base, and um, that, that's that's very nice. Right. Uh, Jack asks, when will all outstanding um, permits uh, come in? So I can I will attempt with that. You know, all outstanding permits. Um, you know, we have a, a, a approach here that we've modeled after successful um, permitting regimes uh, in the country, Lundin Gold being one. That is, we've broken it into various modules. The first being the early works, which is early works slash expiration declines. That's access to the deposit. That's critical path in the construction schedule, and we hope to receive that permit uh, this year. Um, but we've also got permits that address the tail storage facility, the, the concentrator. If you, if you add all of that up, we, we, we hope to have all the permits uh, by late 2025, but we're going to get them in series on critical path schedule. Number one is, of course, what I just spoke about is this development uh, an expiration decline obviously we'll explore when we get close to Cascabel or excuse me the Apollo deposit at depth uh, we can't drill any deeper not that we need more tons but there might be some good grade below us so um, 2025 the end of 2025 so a year and a half two years that'd be two years um, we should have all the permits but we're, we're going to receive permits uh, along the way and then we get the ultimate EIS that, that will not slow down our current development schedule Great. Thanks, God. Uh, now, there's a number of questions I'll, I'll kind of lump together here. Uh, there's people concerned about a lack of uh, timeline on the strategic review. Can you comment on what that timeline might be or what the strategic review process looks like from here? Again, as I mentioned, there is no specific deadline or timeline on the strategic review. And a, a lot of that has to do with the the, uh, the assets because we're, we're allowing you know people to look at uh, the expiration portfolio and it in a, a lot of I said a lot of work's been done on a lot of this of course Cascavel and so there's just a, it's a long pro process um, of course you, you, you mix in the election with that as Chris mentioned you know that'll be the another the middle of October October 15th and we're comfortable with either uh, candidate we support uh, whoever's uh, elected and we're looking forward to working with the new administration but you know, that slowed people down in, in, inevitably because there, there is some, you know, what's going to happen with the election. Uh, we're very comfortable with it. And uh, if you look at who's working in the country, it's not just that we're comfortable with it. There's a lot of strategic companies, large mining companies that are active here or trying to get active here. Um, is, as you may or may not know, the, the mining catastrophe is the ability or the the legal way to acquire uh, land for exploration from the government is closed. And so you have to work with people such as Solgold if you want to start an exploration effort here. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the right rocks, um, some of the, the best porphyry copper uh, rocks in the world. And uh, mm -hmm. and so you're going to have to work with somebody like Solgold and, and uh, Maybe, like I said, there's people interested in it, but it's it's a lot of work to, to go through that vast amount of data before you make an investment. So it's just going to take a while, and, and there, but there is no specific timeline. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions. People want to know your perspective on whether you believe the share price is being manipulated. Huh. I, I should hand that off to Chris, but I'll, I'll go ahead and answer, try to answer that. I, I have no idea. I'm a shareholder. I, I you know, we have thin volumes, um, so obviously it would be easy to move the share around, share price around. But I have no, I, you know, I, I just would have to speculate. Um, but part of the part of the factor is, is, is we're a thinly traded stock, and you buy or sell a, a handful of shares, meaning you know you don't have to invest millions and millions of dollars to move our share price up or down. Um, so I have no idea, but I, I don't think it's being specifically manipulated. Um, you know, it's it's we we've uh, we're in an interesting time. There's been a lack of news flow, admittedly, um, and hopefully that's going to start to improve here in the in the next upcoming months. Um, hopefully, a strategic review can add a little uh, interest. Um, don't know about that, but um, you know we do know that we're going to be able to produce that study, and we're excited about what that's going to do for us. Um, in a lot of different ways, but uh, 
I don't, I don't think it's being manipulated. Um, but you know, I, I don't know, Chris, I don't know if you have any thoughts, want to comment. Well, I guess my overarching thought is if I knew the answer to the question definitively, <laughs> I would be a lot wealthier and in a different position than I am today. Um, yeah, I think I think the reality is the story has had a bit of a complicated history. Um, you know, I think we're in a bit of a show me period now. So we've we've given lots of you know the company, you know, not necessarily Scott and I, but the company in general. The story over the last five ten years is it, it's it's just it's had its challenges. Um, I think with the current political turnover, um, the story is turning over. The direction has changed a little bit in the last six to twelve months uh, with the Cornerstone merger, um, significant management changes. I think people now need to kind of wait to, as the company starts to deliver on its on the, the new strategy, um, it'll give people a reason to buy and as it becomes de-risked. And this is why the work plans that we've laid out today, we believe are are achieving those actions. It's, it's using our dollars the best way we know how to give people a reason to buy the stock. I appreciate that. I got one from David Edwards. Um, he notes that Solgold is an explorer and asks, as an explorer, how is the current operation, which as described as strategic review, different to the normal business of an explorer with a big asset trying to find a buyer or partner? Well, the, the strategic review, um, I wouldn't say it's different. It's just um, that we have such a vast portfolio, Cascabel being the, the tier one asset, and obviously, uh, that's one of the reasons I invested. But it's such a vast portfolio that I've talked about with some, some very good exploration potential. Um, so you, you have, a, 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 I'll call it a, an asset that's uh, moving down a development path. And, and so there's a, uh, an aspect that's a little different from just true exploration. And uh, exploration in, in Ecuador is, is, um, you know, is a process. It takes a while. Um, like any country, you've got to get permits and that sort of stuff. So it's a, um, a strategic review. We're looking at uh, people that are interested in exploration and, and development. Great. Um, this is a question. It, it's a, a couple people have a similar question. It's a question on strategy, really. Um, they're curious why the company doesn't put a, a stop date on the strategic review to try and push interested parties into showing their hand. Yeah, you know that's that's you know you you could have a formal process with a stop date. We made the decision not to, and again I go back to the 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 quality of our assets and just the number of assets, and uh, you know we're we're allowing people to to take their time to to go through the data, conduct site visits if they desire, um, and so we've just made the decision with no stop date. Um, and uh, so we're allowing people to just take their time to review. Um, it's pretty complex because of the, the quality and the number of uh, assets, uh, including Cascabel. Cascabel is a, a lot of work's been done on it, and it's, it's got a huge resource. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity that people need to get, a, get their arms on, and we think that that's a way to make sure that we, we get the right value for any sort of strategic initiative that would – maximize uh, the, our return to shareholders and, and our stakeholders and the right partner uh, who has the resources, technical, capital, you know, financial resources, uh, ESG, all of the things you need to, to execute a, a proper business plan in a responsible manner. I appreciate that. Uh, just for everyone in the room, we don't have time for too many more questions. I'll try to get to uh, as many as we can, but really only going to tackle probably a couple more. Please note, all of this chat has been recorded, and if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure to reach out to you uh, individually to get those questions answered. Uh, so just a, a couple more. One from Jack. Uh, he's curious if Saudi Arabia is exploring an arrangement with Soul Gold and if they're currently coordinating due diligence. So, uh, you know, I don't know if Saudi Arabia is looking at the, pet, the, the, uh, the, the information on a public basis. That's usually where everybody starts. But, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, we're, we would love to be in conversations with anyone that has, um, you know, the resources to, to uh, uh, execute a proper business plan in Ecuador. And certainly Saudi Arabia does. But uh, anyway, they, they may be looking at, looking at us from afar, but uh, we'll see what happens. Great. Uh, so to wrap up, that's a question I often like to ask to conclude these. Um, but really, 
How's the company better positioned than it was a year ago? And I'll, uh, I'll take that. Um, how's it better positioned? I think one, um, we've gotten our cash burn uh, down to uh, at least where we, we have enough cash to function and execute a business plan. And so we've, uh, it was some, some difficult times to, to manage that, but we've got it back under control. And I think that's important to, to uh, uh, have a, 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 an operating expense rate that, that we can manage with, within our means as we move forward and execute a plan. I think that's extremely important. The strategic review. I think that that is is a is a direction for the company, and what what really enabled us to look at that um, and a, in, a, in a wholesome and fulsome basis was, was the acquisition of Cornerstone, and so we've consolidated uh, Cornerstone and and own 100% of Cascabel, and it's it's uh, reduced the complexity of a transaction if anything happens or when it happens. Um, so we're we're encouraged by that, and we're very encouraged by looking at Cascabel a little bit differently and in a, 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 a phased approach with a lower capital cost and then ending up in the same place and lower development. And that, uh, that de-risks the project on a financial basis and quite frankly, on an execution basis. It's, just, it's easier, less complex to build a smaller mine to start than a large mine, just it, just, it is. Um, so I think there's a lot of things going on that way. And, and uh, you know, we, we're excited about uh, the future and we're excited about working here. We're, we're waiting for the elections. We're calm. We believe the, it's going to be a fair election. We're happy with either presidential candidate. We, we look forward to working with the new administrator. So uh, consolidation, strategic review, de-risking Cascabel through low cost initiatives and managing our, our expenditures um, so that we uh, don't anticipate we have, we don't have to raise equity um, We've, we've got those owned shares that Chris talked about. There's a lot of interest in those. So if, if we needed more money, we could, we could always sell those shares and have no intention of doing that today. Great. Thanks so much, Scott and Chris, for taking us through the presentation and for the Q&A session. I also want to thank everybody who joined us. Uh, looks like we had a really international audience today and appreciate particularly everybody submitting questions. Um, I know we didn't get a chance to get to everyone's precisely worded question, uh, but please know we did record it and we will make sure that somebody from the Soul Gold team uh, reaches out to address any concerns that you have. Uh, but we really do appreciate you taking the time to participate in the interactive Q&A. It always makes these events really uh, interactive and great. Uh, so I really i will hand it back to Scott and Chris for a final word before we log off today. Sure. I will, uh, first off, I'd like to thank everyone for spending uh, part of your day with us. And as mentioned, any questions we didn't get, get to, we will reach out to you and uh, uh, try to answer your questions if we can, um, whether it be Chris or I or I, our investor relations group. But uh, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your support. Uh, remember, I'm a long-term uh, shareholder with uh, 18.7 million shares that are about long that I purchased myself. Um, I, I, I really like the Cascadell asset. I think it's truly a tier one asset. And, and this outside exploration, I'm an engineer, not a geologist, but I've been around a lot of exploration programs and uh, a lot of uh, porphyry copper deposits. And, and we've got another one down in Port Veneer. And uh, I know there's another one out there. We just have to uh, find the right partner to help us advance it. And uh, it, uh, so looking forward to what uh, the upcoming months and years do for us. And uh, again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time.